Psalm 135, 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Title of this morning's message, A Very Real God. A Very Real God. Let's pray. Lord, we need you so very desperately. We know we need you desperately, and we don't even know the half of it. But we ask that you would, by your gracious Spirit, move us, change us, search our hearts and our minds, Father, and remove the blind spots that keep us from walking as we ought to walk. We want nothing but your glory in this auditorium, in our hearts this morning. And we know that we're not capable of that, but we trust you by your own power to glorify your own name. Use your word in our hearts. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As a kid growing up in the United States, rural America, in the last century or so, it would have been very easy to assume that idolatry in the world was a thing of the past. In rural America, it would be easy to think that. All the statues and the monuments that you saw had to deal with a hero of some war or some person who did something that was noteworthy in the country or the community. It was just a way to remember their contribution to our society. The average person who'd be my age or older growing up in rural America, the making of idols and the worshiping of idols seems like something that died off in the Bible days, like they were talking about in the Sunday school this morning. It seems like something that died off way back then. But that is actually merely a false impression. For the making of idols and the worshiping of idols is still a very practiced thing. If you go to any foreign port that has little souvenir shops, you will find them filled with idols. If you go to Israel and walk the, down through the streets and all the little shops, you will find them filled with idols. You go to almost any nail salon in the United States and you are going to find there idols. If you really, don't, if you really want to know where it's at, Go down South uh, Army Post Road. When you get to Southwest 9th, turn right. Go about four or five blocks up the road. Look on the left-hand side. And tell me that idol worship is not prevalent in the country today. There is a huge section of idols up there on Southwest 9th. Idolatry flourishes around the world even today. A professor in college told us that in some foreign country, a certain religion had set up a statue on the top of this mountain. And to get to this statue, there were literally hundreds of rough stone steps. And the idea was that you went up to this statue on your knees, crawled up these hundreds of steps to this statue, and you would kiss the finger of the statue, of this idol at the top of these, st these stone steps. And so many people climbed those stairs on their knees and kissed the finger of that statue that they had to switch fingers because they kissed the finger completely off the statue. You're like, that would take a lot of kissing. <laughs> Idolatry is very prevalent still in the world. When Carol and I were in Cartagena, there's an old church there, and all around the inside of the old, this old church, all the walls, there were different stations of idols where people were worshiping, they were praying to these statues. I thought it was really interesting <laughs> as a total aside. 
You know, in some of these churches, they light candles, and you go and you pay to have these candles lit. <laughs> we were in, this, in Cartagena. They had this glass box. It had a coin-operated thing like a gumball machine on the front. And there were LED light bulbs in the candles. So you put your money in there, turn the thing, and they lit an LED bulb instead of actually lighting a candle. <laughs> I thought the money makers have got a hold of this technology has advanced further than what their forefathers had envisioned on that whole thing. But anyway, I got a great, great kick out of that myself, personally. And I have one ordered for the foyer out there, so... <laughs> in this enlightened age. Men still make idols and worship them. And we as God's people scratch our heads at that. It's a piece of wood or plaster or stone. You made it with your own hands. Why would you bow down to that thing? We scratch our heads. Sure, it has a mouth, but you carved that mouth there. It's not going to speak to you. One of, our, one of the old missionary writers writes, he saw an oriental monk going from tree to tree and rock to rock, and he, are you there? And he'd knock on a rock. Are you there? He was searching, hoping that God would answer him out of one of these objects. He got no answer. And the fact that you cut that down and carved it with a mouth does not make it speak. We scratch our heads and say, what are you people thinking? Yes, they have eyes, but they don't, stud they don't see anything. The eyes that they carve there don't see. I read of a study. You know those little boxes of candy they put in stores, and not stores, into office buildings, a little box of candy, and it's got a little slot on the back you're supposed to put your quarter in. It's on your honor. I read of a, stu a study done by a company to see how what your on your honor actually worked like. And so they calculated the percentage of candy that was stolen, well, was not paid for. Okay? After they figured out that percentage, they took the same box... And they put eyeballs on it, a picture of two eyeballs. So as you pick the candy up, there was eyeballs there. And the percentage of stolen candy dropped dramatically because they put two, a picture of some eyeballs there, like the thought of somebody watching you changed their mind. That same idea is what put the little, if you guys are, remember back in the day when electronics was very expensive. And up in the corner, you'd see these video cameras set up everywhere. And it was actually just a plastic box with an LED bulb in the front. That's the only electronic in it was that LED bulb. But the thought that somebody might have a camera on you, it would drop the shoplifting rate. We worry about these things. Having someone watch us alters our behavior. But let me ask you this. If a thief is robbing a nail salon at night, does he wear a mask so the Buddha doesn't recognize him? You say, that's foolishness. I know, because it cannot see. It's an idol. It's got eyeballs there, but you carved them there. It cannot see. It's foolishness. Those eyes are stone, plaster. It's a statue, and it is blind as a bat. Oh, it has ears. You can see them on each side of the head. But they are made of solid material. You can bow and scrape and pray in front of that statue all day long, but it is deaf, as our grandfathers used to say, deaf as... Not dead as a doorknob. Deaf as a... Post! There you go. In fact, it might have been a post. Had you not carved it into an idol, it could have been the fence post in the front of your house. It is deaf as a post. It has these ears that you carved. It doesn't hear a thing. Oh, but it just represents their God, you might say. Maybe, but whatever it represents either never was or is dead and gone. You know what? You can ask the statue of Ulysses S. Grant to join the war on terror. What good is that? 
You can take your cell phone to the statue of Alexander Graham Bell, but he's not going to fix it for you because they are there and gone. It's gone already. Either there never was or it's dead and gone. All of this is ridiculous. To take a piece of stone or wood or a bowl of plaster and to make a god out of it is ridiculous. To carve eyes and ears and a mouth and expect it to see and hear and speak is absurd. And we scratch our heads and say, what are you people thinking? And I believe that is a legitimate question. Why in the world would you bow down to something that cannot see or hear or speak? Now, I think most of us in this room would hardly agree with what I've just said. But here comes the blind spot. Isn't the opposite of that statement also true? If the statement is, why would someone bow down to a God that can't see or hear or speak, it's, that's ridiculous. Isn't it just as ridiculous to act like a God who can see and hear and speak to act like he doesn't? If it's ridiculous for me to think that that could hear me, isn't it not just as equally ridiculous to act like God doesn't? Do you see this? It's a blind spot. We all say that is true. That's stupid to do that. But are you acting, living like God does not see or hear or speak? We sneer at the idols of this world or as completely and totally absurd. And that's true. But then we turn right around and live like the one true living God doesn't see or hear or speak. And that, my friend, is actually a greater absurdity. So let's chase this down just very quickly here. Three simple questions. Number one, what does God see? The Bible says that he sees. We know that the idols don't see. Well, what does God see? Well, the short answer is everything. He sees everything. But often an answer like that is so generic that it doesn't ever help deal with our blind spot. So what does God see? You know what? He sees the trouble that you're facing. I know that you feel like you're all alone and that the old song, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows my sorrow, you feel like that is true, but it just isn't. God sees not only the trouble that, you feel, that you're in, but he sees the solution and the path that leads you back to solid ground. He sees your trouble. He sees the burden that you're carrying. Nobody else knows that you're carrying this burden, but the Lord sees the burden that you're carrying. He sees the problems that are coming down the road. You have a little suspicions about what might be coming, but the Lord knows already the problems that are coming. The Lord sees the needs of your heart. You may have not conversed about those to anybody, but the Lord, He sees the need of your heart. The Lord sees your family situations. You know it's complicated and it's hard to explain to other people what's going on and so you don't talk about it very often, but He sees your family situation. The Lord sees your difficulties at work. It may be ugly. It may be hard to do. Nobody understands, but the Lord understands. He sees the difficulties that you face at work. You know what else he sees? He sees the desire that you have for him. Yes, it's fickle. No, it's not glowing as it should be. It isn't what it could be. But just the same, the Lord sees it. The desire that you have for him. In your heart of hearts, you want to do right. You want to follow the Lord. And you look at yourself and you say, this is a pathetic but the Lord sees that heart that you have for Him. He doesn't despise it. A bruised reed He will not break. 
a smoking flax. He will not quench. Yes. He sees that fickle. You want to have more. The Lord sees it. He knows it. And He doesn't snuff it out. He doesn't despise it. He sees that ember of love in your heart for Him and desires to help you fan that into a flame. He sees that love that you have and the desire for Him. He sees where you are not conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You know it. He knows it. He knows it better than you. But He wants to do the work in your life to make that happen. He sees. What else does He see? He sees your sin. Some people act like that's all that He sees. Some people act like God is up there with a baseball bat just ready to pound the daylights out of you the first misstep that you make. That is not true. Others act like He doesn't see sin at all. Like a two-year-old. You remember when your two-year-old would do something wrong? They, maybe they got a piece of candy they weren't supposed to have. And so they sneak off around the corner and hide in the closet thinking that mom and dad will never know. Some people act like God can't see. Look, my friend, God sees sin. It's not all He sees. He sees all of those other things, but He sees your sin. And it matters. It must be dealt with. It isn't so much the fact that you've sinned. The fact that you have a, the enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. It makes sin almost a foregone conclusion. At some point you're going to fall. It's not the fact that you have sin. That's not the problem. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you of that. The problem is when you ignore it, when you excuse it, or when you act like it's no big deal or even try to hold on to it. My friend, God sees. He sees your sin. And it's an issue. To act like He doesn't see it or that it doesn't matter is an absurdity. The great hindrance to personal and corporate revival is sin in the lives of God's people. My friend, God sees very well. He sees everything. And to act like He doesn't is absurd as acting like an idol does. God sees. Two, what does God hear? What does God hear? The answer here again is everything. But that doesn't really help us that much. Let me tell you what God hears. God hears your cry in the night. God hears your thoughts of despair. God hears the prayers of your heart. The Lord's been working on a message that will maybe come to fruition down the road sometime. Remember Hannah in the temple? She is praying there. And is it Eli the priest who sees her and says, thinks she's, been, she's drunk because her mouth is moving and there's no words, there's no sound coming out of it? The Bible uses a very interesting term there. It says she was pouring out her soul in, to the Lord. And it uses that same term in prayer multiple times. They poured out their heart or they poured out their soul. I'm working through that thought process a little bit here, but you know what? Here her lips are moving. There's no mouth sound coming out. God heard that prayer. God hears the prayers of your heart. Those needs that you express, those hurts that you feel, those things that you fear, God hears those. Did you know that God hears your, pray, your praise and worship? This is such a, a great thought. Think about where God lives. Think about what's taking place. We have a, the door opened up in Revelations 4 and 5 of what that actually looks like at this moment. Here you have the angels in heaven singing, crying, holy, holy, holy. You have these beasts that we can't even get our mind to wrap around what they actually are. They are doing worship. You have all the people who have gone before who know the Lord are there worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. That's what God is surrounded by. But did you know that the Lord hears your praise and your worship? You say, compared to that, I'm just this little tiny voice of nothing. 
That doesn't matter to God. When you come to Him and thank Him for the work that He's done in your life, for the blessings that He pours out on you and your family, when you bring one of His attributes like we've been discussing on Sunday night, God, I'm so thankful that you are eternal and that you're self-existent. I worship you for the amazing God that you are. Out of all of those other things that are going around that God is being praised and worshipped by these amazing angels and creatures, God hears you. And it's sweet music in his ears. You know what? If the President of the United States called today, said, Vanderhart, you are a credit to the country and you're an amazing citizen and I'm so thankful that you're an American and hung up the phone. I'd just as soon have one of my kids call up and say, Dad, I love you. Do you think God is any different than that? That he would value somebody else's words over yours? You're one of his children. He hears your praise. It's not lost in the shuffle. It's not just ignored. It's not just pushed off to the side. God hears you when you worship Him. He also hears what the old hymn writer calls the rebel sigh. It's what your mom called mumbling under your breath. The rebel side. You ever catch yourself doing that to God? That is so irritating in my mind. Here God has been so absolutely good to me. My life is filled with blessings. It is The grace just pours out and all over and everywhere I look. There is grace being poured on my life. And there's one little thing that doesn't match up with what I think is best. And my idea of best has not been very good. My track record on that's not very good. But what I don't think is best at this moment, and I hear in my own heart this rebel sigh. Yes. And that is so irritating. It is so unbelievably disingenuous to do to a God who has poured out so much good in my life. And for me to, as your mom would say, did you just roll your eyes? And that's what we do with God. That rebel sigh. You know, God hears that. He hears that rebel sigh, that grumbling under the, your voice. The Israelites did that all the time, and he wasn't very happy about it, by the way. God hears. What does he hear? He hears everything. To stand in front of a stone statue and try to speak loud enough for it to hear is absurd. <laughs> But to live like God doesn't hear is equally absurd. Number three, what does the Lord say? What does the Lord say? An idol that has a mouth still doesn't speak, but the Lord does speak. So what does he say? No, just be careful here. He's not going to speak audibly in your ear, but he does speak constantly through his word in your heart through circumstances, through his children, God speaks on a continual basis. But what does he say? He says so many things. He tells you the direction of life. He shows you the path to take. He explains the errors in your thinking. He helps you understand what's going on in your life. He speaks peace into your heart. And he speaks comfort to your soul. He says in every situation... Fear not. He says, this is the path of life. Walk ye in it. He also speaks words of love into your heart. It's like a mother who rocks her baby to sleep. Have you ever watched that or done that? What is a mother doing as they rock, as they rock that baby to sleep? They are whispering words of of love continually into the ear of that little child. My friends, this is exactly what the Lord does. 
If we, better, if we would ever stop the raucous noise that's around us, if we'd quit running like chickens with our heads cut off, we would be, if we would be still and know, we could hear the blessed Lord speaking words of love into our hearts. Have you heard him lately? Have you heard these words of love in your heart lately? Or have you been so busy with whatever it is that you're busy doing that you have not heard those sweet words of love from your Lord? He loves you and He speaks that love continually. For some today, you have a slightly different message. You know that God cannot speak words of comfort and cheer and joy into some people's hearts because it would be unjust to do so. If a person is facing eternity without God, there is no comfort or peace. There's nothing comfortable or peaceable about that. How can he speak peace to your heart if you're facing an eternity without him? But if you would stop long enough to listen, you could hear him say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Your relationship with God must be based in the person of Jesus Christ. His death for your sin is the only thing that will reconcile you back to God. This is why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you would stop long enough to listen, you would hear him calling you to salvation this morning. This is what God says. He speaks truth into your heart. He speaks love. And he will speak salvation. To, to treat a piece of stone or a piece of wood or a bowl of plaster like it could see or hear or speak is a ridiculous thought that all of us reject. But to treat God like He cannot see or hear or speak is equally ridiculous because He is a very real God. Let's pray.